first reading this morning is from the Acts of the Apostles. And it describes a really dark time in the early life of the church. Following the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the apostles have bold, boldly proclaimed the good news of God's love and faithfulness revealed in and through Jesus Christ. And as we hear in the chapter right before today's reading, the number of flower, flower, flowers can't speak this morning, is actually growing. So much so, the apostles could no longer serve them and care for them as they felt they should. So coming together, the apostles call Stephen and at least six others to help meet the immediate needs of those who come to hear the apostles and to offer thanks to God through worship for that which they have received by faith and through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Of course, none of this escapes the eyes of the Sanhedrin, who had thought they stifled this movement with the crucifixion of Jesus. The Sanhedrin was the governing body of the Jewish people, a body responsible to God, both for religious and societal justice. But during the Roman occupation, they instead bowed to the Roman authorities more than they did God. It is believed that during the occupation, the Sanhedrin was less concerned with God's justice than they were with maintaining a peace that protected the wealth and privilege they had accumulated over the centuries following Israel's return from the Babylonian exile. Encouraging faithful Jews to report the activities of this growing sect within Judaism, a sect that envisioned Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah, we learn that Stephen, who is serving those in need and sharing the gospel to which he has been entrusted, is arrested outside the city of Jerusalem and accused of blasphemy by Jews who were likely acting on the Sanhedrin's behalf. To have done something like this inside the city of Jerusalem would surely have invited Roman in interference. And instead of silencing the religious and rebellious voice, Roman authorities would have likely dismissed all charges because they were religious and not civil thereby allowing what the Sanhedrin viewed as a perverse message to continue spreading throughout the region. Standing before the Sanhedrin, Stephen listens as his accusers state that the message he is preaching all is showing contempt to God's order and therefore to God. They also declare that he claims divine attributes through the presumptive indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and has even said such attributes are available for all to possess, not just those deemed elect by birth or position. What other fate could await him but death? Still, the role of the Sanhedrin was justice. So they had to give Stephen a chance to defend himself, or at least being seen as doing so. Instead of denying the charges that were placed against him, Stephen boldly proclaims the gospel in their presence, daring to tell the Sanhedrin that they were wrong in their judgment regarding Jesus. And because they were, they would be the ones to face the wrath and judgment of God. Then, in an unprecedented act, the Sanhedrin does not turn him over to the Roman authorities as they did Jesus. Instead, we are told in Scripture that they themselves take him outside the city walls and stone him to death. Standing on the sidelines, giving his tacit approval to what they are doing, by holding their cloaks is a young man named Saul, 
a student of the Sanhedrin, a man possibly being groomed to one day take his place on this august body, a man they would one day send out to arrest those who would dare to say, as Stephen had, that Jesus of Nazareth was God incarnate. After witnessing Stephen's death, the people of Jerusalem, either out of fear or intimidation, could no longer turn a blind eye to those with whom they disagreed. But instead sought to end this movement, their religious leaders said, threaten their standing with God. The followers of Jesus, already cautious and afraid of the Roman and Jewish authorities, began to scatter to the four winds, leaving Jerusalem for the relative safety found in outlying regions of Israel and, and its neighboring countries. The Sanhedrin thought they had taken decisive action against this rebel sect, believing they had stricken a blow to this Jesus movement, had in fact done the opposite. Instead of dealing with a largely centralized movement in Jerusalem and Galilee, their actions spread it throughout the countryside, where its message reached farther and faster than ever before. We face a similar situation today. Like early Christians, we do not feel that it is safe to gather together in worship. Our fears have driven us away from our centralized meeting places. Now to many, this is a bad thing. Because we enjoy the support and encouragement we get from one another when we gather together to worship. But just as the actions of the Sanhedrin sent the followers of Jesus out into the world where the message of hope was enabled to spread farther and faster, so too does this virus. Think about it. Our church, once viewed as this building, has now been literally and physically spread beyond its four walls into the outer communities. This is because the church is not found in the building. It is found in us. And that means the church goes where we go. The question is, does the work of the church go with us? What is that work? According to our catechism, the work of the church is to restore all people to unity with God and one another. The church does this through its prayer and worship, and it does so as it proclaims the gospel, promoting justice, peace, and love. And it does so through each of us. And I might add, no matter where we are. While this seems like dark times in the life of our church, it is also an opportunity. An opportunity for us to take the church and do its work in places and in ways we may never have thought possible before. Take, for instance, this online worship we began started to support and encourage the members of our parish, our Sunday service has a much wider audience. Did you know that each week we have on average 10 people who are not members of our parish living in the outlying communities who either like or comment on our service? That sounds like a lot. And believe me, this is a blessing. But think, think how many lives we might reach if we shared this video with our family and our friends. Instead of 10, we might reach hundreds. 
offering support and encouragement to those who, like us, need it. I know doing this can open us up to unwanted criticism. Because there's those out there who will argue, don't force your faith upon me. But in doing so, are we really? We all see things posted online we don't agree with. What do we do? We scroll past it. Unless someone we know, someone we trust, invites us to take a look. And the more often we are invited to do so, the more likely we are to actually see what excites them. We might still disagree or, or not like it, but at least we listen to what they thought was important. Who knows? Like a seed that is planted, that then spreads and sprouts to new life, maybe in doing so we gain new perspective on an issue that opens us up to new ways of seeing things. I'm not saying that by sharing our online worship, um, be it our Sunday morning services or our Monday through Saturday evening meditations, we'll have the successful nature, as did the exodus from Jerusalem. But if we're able to change just even one life by sharing the message of hope that we know and embrace, we will have successfully done the work of the church, the work we are called to do. Taking God's message of hope and love beyond the four walls of our church building, out there into the world where it can offer hope to those who do not yet know it, bringing unity between us and God and one another.